Welcome to the Two Disabled Dudes Podcast. We believe life is about how we react. Welcome to the Two Disabled Dudes Podcast. Sean, do we have an update on your face? Oh, yeah. It's getting old. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we knew that. (laughs) You know, I regret not using more Neosporin. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's going to be a scar. Yeah. And although it's minor, I can kind of see it. And it's right in the middle of my forehead. So I kind of wish I would have, or not in the middle of the forehead, the, you know, right in between my eyebrows. So, yeah. I, it looks good, man. I mean, there's a lot of other things about your face that are not that great, but right. that looks That's good. That's fair. Wow. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Uh, thank you, and thank you for the folks that tagged us online. It was kind of fun to see that I'm not the only one, and you know we saw pictures of Kyle and some other friends in FA and beyond that uh, showed off their scars as well. And although there's some camaraderie in seeing those photos, they're also heart wrenching because you know the pain. That other people felt in those moments or in those couple days of dealing with an open wound. So, gosh, I am so sorry, but also glad that such injuries were not worse for those of you who were willing to share and tag us. So, thank you. Yep. Sean, thank you for that update. We wish you all the best with your healing. Now, it's time for What Say You. This week on What's I You, I have three selections for everybody, and they're all in the same vein. I want to make the point that you don't have to write a book. You don't have to be compelled to pour your heart out in these comments. These people, the three that I chose, they left really simple comments, but it means a lot. So this first one is from Shell. 0087 she says love this podcast and in the main body that was a title in the main body of her comment she says love this podcast pretty simple right but it means a lot with five stars five star review (laughs) the next one is from joe tyler 2017 Joe mixed it up because his title (laughs) and the main body are a little bit different. The title is Easy Listen, and the main body is Great Podcast. Four words, Sean. That's all. With five stars. (laughs) With five stars. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. simple. Easy. How long did that take? Exactly. uh, What is that about? 13 keystrokes, maybe, or something. Yeah, so WME1221 said, good source of information for folks. And then the main body of the review is, enjoy the podcast. With five stars. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Yes. I love the point that you make. You don't have to write a ton. You know, we're not... It's not about taking 20 minutes out of your day, which I can speak to. This is something I've adopted in my personal life. When uh, companies seek out feedback, you know, like we talked about how I took my car in for an oil change not too long ago, and maybe an airline or hotel stay. When they reach out and say, hey, let us know how we did, I've always said delete and and say no because I'm like, I don't want to take 20 minutes. But then I realize I've got one or two comments. The rest is just picking stars or numbers. It only takes six, maybe eight minutes, which I I find it valuable. Yeah, and really, in those cases, if you had a decent experience, you say it was great. And if yeah, you didn't have a decent on. experience, you say it stinks. 
and that's it. <laughs> you might point out what could make it better, but yeah, yeah, you're right. Keep it short and simple, and and move on. Yeah. So, which is what we should do with this <laughs> with this episode. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Our guest today is Heidi Bear. She's a wonderful friend. She's a licensed clinical therapist, and we had a conversation with her that I think everyone's going to like. So here's Heidi Bear. Heidi Bear, welcome to the Two Disabled Dudes podcast. I feel like there should be like a boop, boop, boop. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Heidi, before we jump in and discuss Ted Lasso a little bit and mental health, can you tell us about what you do? Yes, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I've been a therapist for um, a little bit over 30 years, wow. and I have a private counseling practice, and that means I see clients individually as well as doing, I also do couples counseling, and I specialize in the treatment of trauma, anxiety, and couples issues. Um, although, you know, the full range of mental health issues come up with my clients, um, a lot of grief work, um, a lot of adjusting to things that are happening in life. And of course, in the past couple of years, it's been adjusting to living in a global pandemic and all of the, you know, things that come up with that. What would you say is your favorite part or aspect of what you do? the first time I learned about counseling or, or to becoming a counselor actually was um, working in um, addictions counseling. And it was a sanctioned way to talk about spirituality on the job. Mm. So in the, in the field of um, substance abuse um, back in the day, one of the main um, treatment uh, methodologies was 12 step facilitation, helping people right. get into 12 step recovery and in 12 step recovery, um, spirituality is a huge component and I have a, you know, very, um, very dedicated spiritual practice and it's, and it's grown a lot through my lifetime. Um, but being able to talk about spirituality and psychological well being was like, you know, to me, the perfect marriage of things that I just love. Heidi, we're here to talk a little about Ted Lasso. Mm -hmm. And so for people who haven't seen it, like Sean, Sean, have you seen Ted Lasso? Nope, not at all. All right. So I, th I don't think it'll be hard to have this conversation without having seen the show. Ted Lasso is about a college football coach who gets recruited by a Premier League pro soccer team in London. And he moves over there and he finds a team that's divided in a cliques. And he works to unite them using his unique brand of constant positivity. <laughs> his coaching technique actually works, and they start winning, and he kind of pulls everyone together. And it's really amazing to see because you really feel the characters going one direction and then taking a left turn somewhere and kind of coming together because of... Ted Lasso, and he's got so many amazing, like, inspirational speeches in the locker room that are, like, a little bit unconventional, right? Ted himself, he's hilarious, kind, seemingly unflappable. He makes strong connections with everyone he meets. He's very good at what he does. He's sure of himself, but we all get a look into the immense struggle of his life. His marriage is falling apart, and during the show, it comes to an end. At some level, he certainly feels like a failure because of it. And at one point, he has a full-blown panic attack. And I love this because we all see people that have it seemingly all together. Yeah. And, but we know we all struggle. And so yeah. seeing someone that has so much going for him and seeing him struggle like crazy is really comforting to me. And I think probably a lot of people. Heidi, do you have thoughts on why Ted Lasso affected you so deeply in your journey, in your job and in, in your own mental health? Yeah, I, I was really impressed with um, how... Right away, you could tell in the very first episode that for Ted 
to have emotional, deep, connected relationships is one of the most important things in his life. And he has a deep, deep connected friendship with his best friend, who's his coach, uh, his, his, his like, you know, um, partner, the guy that, that coaches with him, his name is coach beard in the show. He has a yeah. big beard, but his name is coach beard. <laughs> and, um, and he and coach beard have a really long friendship. You can tell they have a lot of inside jokes with each other, but they also, they talk deeply with each other about lots of things. And immediately when, when Ted lands in um, England, he's, he's working to, to establish uh, relationships with, with everybody. And I loved how he's, he's really interested to know who people are and what it is that, that makes them who they are. Mm. And so um, I love that he didn't care about superficial sorts of things, whether if someone was the best or the fastest, he wanted to know a little bit more about what makes them tick. So that mm. was of great interest to me. And then, yes, I was, I was really impressed that, here we see this guy who looks like he's funny and he's, he's got lots of little line, you know, one liners and, and quips and things. And then we see behind the scenes, he actually really is struggling. We see right away that he's struggling in his marriage, um, which is, which is coming apart at the seams. And, um, and then we see uh, his anxiety start to come out and he's trying to hide it from the players and, and the people that he's with. And, and at one point, right, we see that he has this full blown panic attack. And then, and then he quickly tries to just sweep it under the rug. And a few people around him are like, yeah, that, yeah. Oops. We, we don't have to talk anymore about that. And he's like, okay, we won't, you know, yeah, so yeah. The people around him are also, they're uncomfortable to talk about it. Hmm. Um, but of course, as the series progresses, um, things change with that as well. So, um, I mean, I was hooked fr- from a lot of different viewpoints, you know, that, that they're, that they're making uh, characters on the show that have, these very real struggles that, that many of us struggle with um, relationship yeah. issues and um, you know, crossroads in life and um, and many people who have anxiety aren't sure where it comes from. Ted has no idea why he's had a panic attack. He doesn't understand mm. all of it. It takes him a long time to understand that. Yeah. And, and we actually start to see his journey with it. So it's, it's really, I thought they they've done an incredible job. It's hard to believe that Ted has no idea what is causing his panic attacks. And so why does that happen? And I certainly know that from my journey in therapy that it's like, oh, my gosh, how did I not see that? And so why does that happen to us? We have um, we have so many things that we manage in our lives when we're growing up and we believe the people the adults around us we believe what we're told many times even if something doesn't feel right we'll be like okay i guess so you know it didn't feel right for my eighth grade art teacher to say that i was that i was horrible at art (laughs) but i was like okay you know it took to age 50 for me to do to make art right Mm. from age 13 to 50 no art Mm. and then finally at age 50 i'm like maybe she didn't know what the hell she was talking about (laughs) (laughs) um and so we we believe that people are situations even if they don't feel okay to us many times um or and or we also compartmentalize what doesn't feel okay you know we just sort of yeah get in a box on the shelf or put up a little wall or sweep it under the rug and we just carry on because there's so much we have to deal with and do in life um so sometimes we're we don't figure out what's under the surface until it's until it starts to just like rise up and um yeah. you know if you keep sweeping stuff under a rug like i could sweep something under my rug right now and, and you wouldn't be able to tell but if i kept sweeping stuff under the rug in the living room like at some point you'd be like heidi why is there a big like <laughs> lump under the rug and i'd be like yeah, yeah. what lump because i'm used to about? walking around it <laughs> but you show up at my house and you haven't been there for you know two years in the pandemic you'd be like Last time I was here, there was not a lump on yeah, the yeah. <laughs> you know? But we get used to adjusting to our life the way it is until something else can get our attention or break it open. Or mm. So we don't recognize those things until they become a problem. Yeah. 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 And sometimes it's that, you know, when things are are really showing themselves, also there's a there's a school of thought that that we we now have the emotional readiness to face it. We now have the emotional 
tools mm-hmm. or well-being or support that like ne- it's coming up now. I mean, I'm I'm never surprised when people walk into my office in their 40s or 50s and 60s with like major things happening and I'm like, "Yep, now now you have the opportunity to to face this thing that you might not have had the opportunity to face or understand earlier in life." Yeah. If we were to back up, you know, I don't know, 10,000, 20,000 feet in the air, we talk about, or you, you know, again, I've never seen this show, but the, the explanation about this character, Ted Lasso, he seems to be doing great in one area of life, right? He's succeeding at coaching and he's, the team's winning and, and things are good while his marriage falls apart. And I'm, I feel like it's, that's a pretty common scenario for a lot of people. Maybe not that exact story, but we're doing great in one hand and we're failing on the other or we're struggling, maybe not failing, but we're, we're struggling or having a hard time. And whether it's, you know, everything is great with the kids and family and things are falling apart at work or vice versa. What do you suppose, you know, if you could name one maybe two big factors in this what i presume is a common scenario what do you think the the issue is what are we doing wrong as a society (laughs) well the ethos in america is independence and success Mm. and productivity it's different than some other parts of the world where the ethos might be family, community, connection. Mm. Mm. America is like, you know, do it on your own, you know, you're pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And you're like, I'll need some help. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the values, and I think in the United States, it might be, you know, not the best in, in some of that. One thing I love about y'all's podcast is you talk about that you normalize that like there are hard things happening in life and there's also ways to get through it and we can't just you know stick our head in the sand about something that's hard we actually have to figure out you know we have to face it we have to seek help there's nothing wrong with seeking help um in lots of different ways um and i think in our society some people there's still a huge stigma about mental health counseling for one thing people think you have to yeah. be crazy you think you have to be nuts something has to be super wrong with you and every so often i have someone come in and say i just wanted to find someone to talk to about things i'm like awesome um you know someone who's like actually curious about exploring their their life and their well-being but usually it's a crisis that brings somebody in Mm -hmm. to counseling and they're also worried what what their what their friends their loved ones might think um but you know you, you don't have to have a a huge thing happening in your life to, to be able to seek support, to be able to say that I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time with this. Right. Speaking of that stigma, in season two of Ted Lasso, one of the all-stars, he's really struggling because a, kind of a silly thing happens. The mascot is a dog. And during one of the games, he's doing a penalty kick and a bird flies in front of the goal, and he kicks the ball, and it hits the dog and kills the dog. And that puts him into, he's like the best soccer player ever, whatever, he's the best on the team. And But that incident puts him into a downward spiral. He's not performing on the pitch, and he's having a really tough time, so the team hires a therapist to work with him specifically to see if she can get him out of this funk. And he experiences amazing results. Mm -hmm. His mantra before or during this show is football is life because that's all he loves is football. And when he comes out of the therapy session, he says, Dr. Sharon taught me that football is life. But it's also death. And also, football is football. (laughs) And so it was really profound, right? In kind of a silly way. So then all the players start going to Dr. Sharon. 
and they're all having these breakthroughs and everyone's understanding themselves a whole lot better. But then it comes to Ted and it's his time to go in and he's very resistant to it. The first time he went in, he said to Dr. Sharon, so let me get this straight. I'm paying you for an hour, but this session is only 55 minutes. And so he's picking at all the things that he distrusts about her, right? And so are there other stereotypes about therapy when people go in that reasons they don't trust the process or the ther- maybe not the therapist because it could be a hundred different people, but yeah. why do people not trust the process of therapy? A lot of people don't trust therapy because they've heard their friend had a bad experience or they themselves mm. had a bad experience when they tried it before. And I'll tell you what, you know, so, um, you know how people say like, I need a good car mechanic. And you're like, why? And they're like, well, my last car mechanic was horrible. And you, you talk to five different friends in your city to find out that three of them say, don't go to this person. And three of them say, do go to this person. So there's good car mechanics and there's bad car mechanics. Right. So for every profession in the world, there's people who are really good at their job. And there's people who are like, oh, not good at their job. And in my profession is the same in therapy um, in the world of therapists. Um, there's people who in town who I know are phenomenal. And there's people in town I would never ever, ever recommend um, <laughs> <laughs> because I've met them and I know how they act. And then I've heard from former clients of theirs what's happened when they've mm-hmm. you know left there. So it happens everywhere. And what we see with Ted Lasso is um, when he kicks the ball and it kills the dog, he doesn't want to, he can't play anymore. So they said, we need to get Danny back to his best. And, and Danny has this incredible experience, but, but Ted says, Oh, I don't want to, I don't think we should bring a psychologist in like, that's a bad idea. And someone says, why do you think that? You know? And he said, "Um, well, my wife brought me to her therapist and then the marriage went even more downhill and now I got divorced. And so yeah. I don't trust the therapist. Mm. And I thought, aha, you know what? She shouldn't have brought him to her therapist. They should have gone to a neutral party. Right. So that therapist made a mistake. But I get why he mistrusts therapists, right? Yeah. And, and somebody might say maybe they went to a neutral therapist and it would still go downhill. I mean, so, right, because sometimes marriages and relationships have – sometimes, you know, a uh, expiration date on it from the very beginning, you know, sometimes, I mean, my, my first marriage, <laughs> it had an invisible expiration date. I finally saw it. <laughs> got out of that. So, you know, that was, it was good to get out of it. It's good to get out of a relationship that is not working or a relationship that's unhealthy. Um, yeah. And sometimes therapists can help with that. But for, for someone like Ted, he saw the therapist as part of what helped his marriage dissolve. He didn't, he wasn't taking responsibility or understanding his role or their role, or he was just thinking about that. So people sometimes have a bad experience in therapy because the therapist is bad. Um, therapists have yeah. poor boundaries sometimes um, and they shouldn't. And I was very concerned about Dr. Sharon having good boundaries on the show. And I, you know, sometimes therapists in movies and, and TV shows are not portrayed appropriately. So I was mm. really concerned about that. But so far, they've kept her boundaries. So I was yeah. really relieved about that. Um, yeah. And it's different, too. She's working as a sports psychologist with the whole team. And I have actually worked with, um, I've done retreat work with Wounded Warriors Project over the years. And when you're when you're a therapist or a or, or being a therapeutic support to a large group of people, like a, like a team or a group on a retreat at, at the same time, you do have some social interaction with the group that's different from the therapeutic interaction, hmm. but it's different. Therapists aren't, aren't friends with their clients. We have to have a boundary. There has to be a boundary. So, so she you know has to walk a fine line, that character, Dr. Sharon, um, but it, it's complicated. Hmm. And a lot of the world doesn't understand that. I've had clients come in and we have had a great session. They're like, wow, I wish I'd met you. Um, I wish I'd met you, you know, at the, at a yoga studio or, or, you know, at a, at a bar and we could have just struck up a conversation because I think (laughs) we could totally be friends. And I'm like, that is so nice. Thank you. And 
it's never happening because now you're my client. <laughs> you <know? laughs> I will never be sitting down yeah. and having a cocktail with you. Um, and they're like, that's all right. You know, Heidi, speaking of the boundaries that therapists need to set, and specifically for Dr. Sharon, she seems straight laced and together, but she's clearly hurt when Ted sort of attacks her when he goes in to have his appointment. Yeah. Goes, this is BS. I have to pay for an hour, but you're only giving me 55 minutes. What's up with that? And she was a little bit hurt by that comment. But then we see that Dr. Sharon herself is struggling, partly from the way that that comment affects her, but also a couple other things in her life. And we really understand that Therapists are people too, and they struggle just as much as all the rest of us. Yeah. Can you give us a little look into the life of a therapist and how you manage your own health with your client's health? And and maybe you have your own therapist that you see. We kind of catch Dr. Sharon with in a conversation over the phone. With mm -hmm. we're not we don't know I guess if it's her therapist or maybe an advisor or something like that but you know she's talking to somebody about what do I do in these situations and so how do you manage all of that with all of your clients stuff that they bring to you as well? All therapists go through a period of um, intense training where they have supervision and they are required to have weekly supervision with uh, a therapist who has much more experience. And in that time period, they staff cases and, and a therapist like myself, I would talk about how I'm doing emotionally as well as how I'm handling my clients' cases and, and make sure I'm kind of doing things in, in what would be, you know, um, ethical fashion and things like that, best practices. So all therapists have to go through two years of supervised training after they um, finish their graduate programs mm -hmm. and in the beginning of their licensure. But after they're licensed... Therapists are not required to have supervision after that. They're required to have education and training every year, you know, 20 to 40 hours per year of training. So, so continuing educational credits, but um, some therapists never then seeks peer supervision after that. Hmm. And that is a bad decision. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I think really intelligent therapists, um, do continue to have supervision. So I have colleagues that I have peer supervision with people who are trained and we don't use our clients names or identifying information, but we do supervise or, or co um, give peer supervision about a case that that's difficult or something that we're struggling with. So we listened to Dr. Sharon, she could have been talking to her own therapist, which would be an incredible thing for the show to model because mm -hmm good therapists get therapy. Hmm. So I got therapy at the beginning of my career. And during the pandemic, I went back to therapy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So because this pandemic has been a thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's affected a lot of people when you said, do things come up later in life? And I'm like, why do I feel <laughs> X, Y, Z, right? So, yeah. you know, I'm 57 years old. And in the last two years, I figured out, oh, this feeling I've had that, comes up in this way it's from this thing from my childhood and i'm like how did i not know that oh, yeah <laughs> how did how does it take me so long to figure this out um yeah. but sean it's what you were asking about before like why do things take so long to come out and sometimes they just do yeah. and the best thing we can do is be seek to understand ourselves seek to be really compassionate with ourselves and then get mm -hmm. get support and clarification and then and then also, can I do something to help heal this thing that hurts? And so I think good therapists get therapy. Good therapists, if they're struggling, go back to therapy. And I was really glad that I went back to therapy because it helped me get some clarification about some things like, oh, goodness gracious, yeah. I'm, glad I'm understanding this now. Because I want my most prized relationships to to do well, you know? Yeah. How I was feeling, right? If I'm if I'm struggling with fear. Um, uncertainty about my well-being, then I don't show up well in my relationships. Sure. That affects the people I love, right? It affects my marriage. It affects my friendships. And that's not a good thing. 
Yeah. yeah. So doctor, I can't just doctor heal myself. I actually needed to, to be working with somebody and it was extremely helpful. So we see the show sort of um, showing us something of that. It, it seems like right. possibly getting, if not therapy, then peer supervision about this. We have not heard her talking about or address what looks like potentially some substance um, oh, a, that's uh, right. There's a bunch of like empty bottles in her kitchen, uh, right? Like, lot. like, like not just like one, like a shelf full of empty mm-hmm. wine bottles or look, it looks like wine, but who knows? And, um, and there's like nothing else on the counter. There's right. like, a, there's like a bowl with one apple and then like, you know, 10 empty wine bottles. Yeah. And she walks into the kitchen and Ted is there cause he's helped her come home. Cause she's had a bicycle accident and he has to help her with that. And, and she is uncomfortable and awkward. He's, right. that, he's like, Oh, Oh, but we see <laughs> that Ted has his own alcohol misuse issues. Yeah. So no one's talking about that. Yeah. Mm, um, they can continue like, co-conspiring to sweep under the rug for each other well yeah. but but i don't think it hasn't been revealed widely about his his alcohol mm, misuse. yeah but that but but we hear that he says in the very first season he said um when he's at a he's playing darts with rupert the um the like the nemesis guy and um and they challenge new rupert challenges him to darts without knowing that that Ted is really good at darts. And right. Ted says, you know, if you were curious instead of judgmental, you would have asked me, Ted, have you ever played darts? And then he said, and I would have said, yes. Boom. And he hits, a, he hits like the triple 20. And he's like, I yeah. said, yes, I played every <laughs> Sunday of my life from age 10 to age 16 in a bar with my dad on Sundays. Yeah. That's so funny. I totally used that curious judgmental quote in an episode like I don't know, three episodes ago, but I, yeah, I love that so much. Curious, not judgmental. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, I think that's a, that's the thing, right? We see Dr. Sharon's got these wine bottles up there. We see that Ted can sometimes drink heavily, but if we're curious, instead of judgmental, we have the opportunity to, to understand what's underneath it. And then right. they also have the opportunity with each other, right? She has opportunity with them. He, people have opportunity with each other to say, like, what's up with that? What's going on? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. I feel like that's probably got to be insightful for ourselves, too. Like, maybe it'll teach us something about the way we cope or the way we numb out or whatever it may be. Oh, 100%, Sean, yeah. Yeah, The one of the best books I read during the pandemic was a book by Oprah and Dr. Bruce Perry, mm-hmm. and it's called What Happened to You? Dr. Perry is a child psychiatrist, and Oprah, of course, has um, a long history of um, being very open about mental health and her own healing from sexual abuse growing up. And, uh, and you know, on her show, she did a lot of work with mental health issues in the life of her Oprah Winfrey show. And so they, they co-authored this book and, and Dr. Perry suggests that instead of asking people, what's wrong with you? Why are you doing that thing? Why are you drinking so much, Ted and Dr. Mm-hmm. Sharon? And why are you, you know, being such a hothead, Jamie Tart? And why are you this and that Roy Kent, you know, the different characters on the show. Why are you this way? Why are you the other? The question is not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you? Mm-hmm. It's not your fault, but things happen. It's just mm-hmm. part of life. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, I don't know, maybe we're going to hear more about, you know, Ted was, Ted was not only in a bar with his dad from age 10 to 16, but his dad died when he was 16. And the first thing that Ted did when he learned about his dad's death, he said, the first thing I did is I went to the fridge and grabbed a beer and sucked the whole Mm -hmm. thing. And you're like, that's and it's the story he tells Dr. Sharon. And you're like, right. There's these little clues like, Oh, Mm -hmm. Oh. And we see, we see some, some heavy drinking, Solid, solitary heavy drinking from mm. Ted in the show as his marriages come apart as mm. in the aftermath of these panic attacks. And um, so, you know, this opportunity to be curious instead of judgmental is there for us. What's happened for yeah. him, happened to somebody else when they're, when they're showing us, when people show us themselves, it's like, Oh, could we wonder what's going on? And, and for ourselves, yeah. it would be the same thing. Could I wonder 
why is the first thing when the pandemic struck, I thought I need to go to the store and get cheese doodles. Why is that? Because <laughs> 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 I grew up in a food centric household. That was the answer. To that question. <laughs> As we can see, everybody has something to talk about. Everybody struggles with something. Yeah. In fact, there's probably a listener or two out there that is struggling like we all are and trying to figure out how to start their journey of not continuing to sweep things under the rug like we were talking about. And maybe there's people that want to seek help. What do you think is the first step in looking for help and seeking a professional? I always think it's so brave and wonderful when someone calls me up and says that they're interested in coming in for therapy. And there are times when folks call me and say, I got your name and phone number from a friend of mine. I'd like to schedule an appointment. When's your next available appointment? And I'm like, hot dog, they're in. <laughs> right? they're, they've got the referral from a friend and the friend has said, she's really good, just make an appointment. And so that's great. So if you can be, if a person can be brave enough to talk to their network of friends and say, you know, what, I'm actually thinking about going to therapy. Do you have, have you ever heard the name of a good therapist in this town? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A person could call up their physician if they have a physician um, they could, if they're a member of a church, they could speak to a, a clergy member or a pastor. Psychologytoday.com. You can go there and it'll say find a therapist and you can um, put in your zip code and it'll show therapists that show up near you. I love to get a sense of people by going to their website and just seeing um, how do they talk about themselves. If they have a social media presence, right. you want to look at that. So Heidi, we're going to let you go to enjoy the rest of your Sunday, but where can people find you and connect with you specifically on social media or otherwise? My website is HeidiBearLCSW.com. On Instagram, it's HeidiBearLCSW. On Facebook, it is Feel Peace Now, which was the, it's the name of my business because I'm in the business to help people feel peace now. I'm a licensed counselor in the state of Florida, but I'm also I have a really excellent uh, skill set in EFT tapping. And I do tapping uh, coaching and joy coaching with people from around the country and different parts of the world too. So if someone is interested, they can always call me up and ask me a question. If they're interested in you know, looking for someone in their area, um, a licensed therapist, sometimes I can yeah. help give them some guidance if I know somebody in that area. One more question comes to mind. What do you think is the goal of therapy? Like you say, feel peace now. That seems pretty clear. Like, all right, that's what my goal should be. I don't know. What should we think about for ourselves? What our outcome should be from going to therapy? I'm a, you know, a Catholic-ish yogi that studies a lot of Buddhist teachings. Mm. And in, in mm. Buddhism, um, my favorite beloved spiritual teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, always taught us that we could have peace now you can have peace in every moment when you return to the present moment and connect to and focus in on your breath and you can just practice this peace right here right now and the more i practice it the more i might be able to have not, not just this little tiny moment of peace but a little bit longer and a little bit longer so even mm -hmm. in a storm i could have some peace inside me so I do believe in the opportunity and the and the and the practice of it and the you know the potential for feeling peace now and and as a and as a counselor my goal and my hope is for folks to be able to be able to understand their worth and their well-being that every single person is is beloved and worthy of loving that no one has to do anything to ch you don't have to change one iota to be mm. more wonderful and more better but you might want to change some stuff to have a more satisfying life. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. I appreciate the way you say that. I've I've read a couple things just recently on meditation and that whole uh, maybe school of thought on enjoying those moments and kind of recentering and breathing and things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm nowhere near expert level, but hearing you talk about it it's like, okay, even in the midst of a storm, there there can be peace. And I feel like, I don't know if it's the human way or the American way, but we 
I think often we assume there is no peace until the issue is resolved or until that burden goes away. Mm-hmm. And from just hearing you talk, it's like, no, you you can feel it for a moment. And then, sure, maybe you have to go back home and deal with that upset house or or the tension or whatever it may be, that, that job that drains you. But even just feeling those moments, I assume, will help you move in a direction to where... Maybe it might take a few weeks, few months, few years, but that issue does become resolved or does work out, and perhaps it never would have had you not experienced that moment briefly a long time. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, maybe I'm rambling, but I love no, you hearing can. you speak yeah. to it that way. Yeah, it's just what you said there, Sean. We can, we really can put those moments together, and we are going to go back to things being a, a total mess at work or our home or wherever, or this relationship is, is hard or, or this situation is hard. Mm. Um, we've all, the whole world has gone through such, you know, huge things in the past two years. And, and as we enter this third year, of the pandemic wondering, are we going to have to deal with another variant or is it going to be hard again? Are we going to have to go back to all these things? The opportunity for practicing peace is with us every single day. If I remember then I have the opportunity to, to right now just come back into the present moment, put my feet flat on the floor to just to give my body some physical feedback to feel my body mm-hmm. in the chair and just notice I'm right here right now. Yeah. And when I yeah. practice that again and practice that again, it, it does create these a little bit bigger moments. And then I might be able to pause when I feel something internally rise up within me instead of being in my reactive mind I might be able to remember to breathe just a moment and have kindness be the lead there for myself mm. or whoever I'm interacting with rather than judgment, right? It's the, it's the be curious, not judgmental. It's the kindness ethic of, of Ted Lasso again, like that. Can I be kind to myself? Can I be compassionate with myself? And if I, gosh, if I keep practicing, I'll tell you what, when I'm remembering to practice, it works way better. Yeah, the fact is that that storm never goes away. There's always something brewing, right? Yes. And so if we can find a way to not associate like peace with getting rid of the problem, because there's always something. Yeah. But if we can do it separately from that, even in parallel to like everything falling apart. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's so hard with the with the war happening um mm. being waged in Ukraine right now. It's so it's so awful and yet there are people there and people in those neighboring countries who who continue to look for beauty mm. and practice um you know feeling even small and brief moments of joy and that does mm. give them a little bit of internal peace and then they might from that place of a little bit more internal peace they might have a different action or reaction to what's happening around them right sure. they might be able to speak differently to to what's going on their heart may be moved in another way and that that's for us to do as well yeah well, Hattie, I will say I'm glad we know you on the non-therapist side because you're always fun to have a cocktail with. So, yeah, um, <laughs> or uh, you know, I don't know what is it, crash our hotel room to iron a shirt or whatever it may be, or whatever. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we know you. Not for repeats of all that. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I miss you guys so much. It's going to be really nice to be in person again. I would absolutely absolutely love to do that with y'all. All All right, Heidi, thanks for sharing your insight today and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye. Sean, what a valuable conversation. I feel like she gave us a few things to walk away with from that that we can really think about and apply right now just in our thoughts and in our lives day to day. Yeah, always love engaging with Heidi and getting her perspective. She's a beautiful soul, and I'm glad to be connected with her. And I'm thankful that she took that time not to have a silly yet meaningful conversation with us today. I agree. So, Sean, let's move on to thank you notes. Who do you have to thank today? Kind of twofold, actually. 
my team at work, people I work with every day, and the concept or this company goal we have titled Constant Improvement. As a company, and we believe you've got to keep getting better, right? Nobody gets better naturally or by accident. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of put that in those two words, constant improvement. What we did last year isn't good enough this year. What we did yesterday, not good enough today. And in that spirit of constant improvement, I've got a handful of people that I work with on a daily basis that are committed to that. And recently, I feel like we've had more and more conversations where we are intentional about asking each other, where did I go wrong? You know, what can I do better? Whether it's just a presentation tip or an attitude or approach Mm -hmm. or whatever it may be. So I'm grateful to be surrounded by a handful of people that are a safe place to play with the idea of constant improvement so thank yep. you to paul Cal, and jeremy and alex and taylor my thank you note goes again to my neighbor joan oh, i've talked joan. about joan before mm-hmm. i had a big shipment of a couch come recently and i had all this cardboard mm-hmm. and that can be overwhelming if you're trying to get the cardboard out, especially in a wheelchair. And I I really didn't want to let it sit till I call somebody, one of my friends, come over. So anyway, Joan said, contact me anytime. So I texted her. She was at my door in like five minutes. Oh, She's wow. like, oh, yeah, no problem. Takes it to the garbage and or the recycling and just takes care of it for me. So thank you, Joan. All right, Joan. Do you think she listens to the podcast? I don't. I I doubt it. Do you think she? Well, do you know is Joan single? <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm asking for I, a friend. No, uh, I'm not. No, she yeah. is not single. She's not. I'm, okay. I, yeah. All sorry right. about that, Sean. All right. No, it, it's fine. <laughs> um, but I, one more question about this card boy. Yes. I happen to know who helped you pull the couch out of the box and uh, helped yes. you put the couch together. Why didn't he help you with the cardboard as well? <laughs> uh, uh, dude, that is a good question and something that I am going to hold against him yep. till the day we leave this earth. So yeah. Selfish. Yeah. I don't know what, what's going on. <laughs> no, that that's another thank you to Alex Fielding who helped me put the couch together. So thank you, Alex. <laughs> and for the record, I'm just I love Alex. He's Alex is my best friend. So I I'm one of the listeners now. I'm I'm just throwing shade for fun. <laughs> thank you for listening today. Please share this episode with a friend if you had fun just like Sean and I did. Go online, rate and review the podcast. As we said at the beginning, you don't have to spend Three hours think I mean, go ahead if you if you have three hours to spare, we'd love to hear no, and read no, your don't. entire we, we don't want to read that. <laughs> That's too much. <laughs> the point is you don't have to do that. You can spend thirty seconds and leave a quick review. Please check our website for the show notes for more information about Heidi, including her website and how to get a hold of her, all her social media. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, keep living with urgency. Thank you for listening to the Two Disabled Dudes podcast. This show is possible with your support. Visit twodisabledudes.com to donate. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app.